Titan and the vicious nature of its propellant that makes the weapon so hazardous to us. The best evidence of that is in the Air Force's own safety studies. They show that in 1978, for example, it was nine times more dangerous to work on a Titan site than in any other job in the Air Force or the Strategic Air Command. And in the seven years between 1973 and 1980, the accident rate due to human error or system failure had increased ten times. It is dangerous. It is dangerous. It's dangerous to the people that work on it. It's dangerous to the people that are in the surrounding areas around the missile for the simple reason that once the tanks puncture, that's it. There's nothing we can do to prevent it, to stop it. I'm Mike Wallace. I'm Orly Safer. I'm Harry Reasoner. I'm Ed Bradley. Those stories and more tonight on 60 Minutes. Prepare yourself for a little shock. This year, many traditional full-size cars are no longer full-size cars. This one is... Marquee from Lincoln Mercury. Marquee gives you all the comfort you need. Plus the kind of smooth ride that makes driving a pleasure. Marquee from Lincoln Mercury. Can you see yourself riding in anything less? When this young executive bought a house, he looked in towns where the commuter trains were reliable, smart. And when he bought a new car, he researched resale prices on the model he wanted, smart. And today, he's placing the biggest order for plain paper copiers in his company's history. He chose Savin, the company with an extensive product line and the largest service network in the industry. Smart. Those two men behind me, Frank Turple on the far side and Gary Corkola, are hardly household names. But their names are very familiar to law enforcement officials in New York and Washington and to various officials in Libya and Lebanon, Uganda and Syria. First of all, they are wanted by the state of New York, for the two of them were convicted in absentia earlier this year of conspiring to sell 10,000 machine guns and 10 million rounds of ammunition, plus a variety of poisons, conspiring to sell all that to a couple of undercover New York police officers posing as South American revolutionaries. However, they fled the United States the day before their trial began. Frank Turple is also wanted by federal authorities on a variety of charges. He is an ex-CIA agent who, with his partner Edwin Wilson, stands accused of selling to Muammar Gaddafi's Libya huge amounts of explosives, plus contracting to supply Green Berets to train terrorists in Libya. In other words, an assortment of people are looking for Turple and Korkula right now anxious to learn more about the various conspiracies and crimes for which they're charged. A week ago, they agreed to talk to us. We found Frank Turple and Gary Corkula living in Lebanon in the city of Beirut. Found them on the balcony of Corkula's apartment. They've been living in the Middle East for the past year, and when we first met them, they were conspiring on yet another deal. Not weapons this time. Instead, they were working on the menu for an Italian restaurant they plan to open in Beirut. And for the beef, we can get top quality, even imported if we want, at reasonable prices. The same people Why is it, we asked Corkola, that U.S. authorities are so intent on getting hold of Frank Turple? I can't answer that. No, you've got to have some idea. That's only my own opinion. Yeah, what is it? Well, there's, there's two sides of it. One, they want Frank back, and I think equally hard, there's another group that doesn't want him back. They want him out of the way. There's some people want him out of the way, I think. Why do they, they want, want Frank Turple out of the way? What kind of information, Frank? What is it that you know that makes you so valuable, such a hot property? I really don't know. It depends on the agency that really, I think, the agency that wants it. It could be as simple as... Uh, as what? As illegally exporting technology. How does, how was it done? Maybe that's it. All this, of course, has to do with the checkered career of Frank Turple, since he was cashiered from the CIA almost 10 years ago for misappropriating agency funds, among other things. How does a CIA employee turn from doing a job for his country into becoming a renegade's book for hire? How and why? Well, I imagine it would just be like a... Uh close-knit circle like your camera people. What happens if he leaves uh, your network 
and jumps out on his own. That's his only, that's primarily his livelihood. That's what he knows. So you started your own... Uh, agency. Agency for hire. Agency for hire. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're a gun for hire, you're a spook for hire for uh, men for whom you don't have a good deal of respect. A buck is a buck is a buck. A buck is a buck is a buck. Frank Turple is under federal indictment for his dealings in Libya with Muammar Gaddafi, so he was reluctant to answer questions on that subject. We began instead with Uganda and his old friend Idi Amin, whom he had served as a top advisor until Amin's overthrow. In 1977, you struck a $3.2 million deal with Idi Amin, correct? For oh. weapons, communications, gear, and torture equipment. <laughs> that was a supposed paper found by I don't know whom. You mean supposed paper? I have a copy of it here. So I can type anything. Keep going. Keep going. Whose signature is here? That looks like it could be my signature. Frank Turple, whose signature's up here? I have no idea. Field Marshal Amin. <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, it is? It is. A contract may have been drawn, but it was never consummated. You mean you never not, you never got the 3.2? No, I did not. What are you even living on? What are you even living on? Frugal savings. Before you skipped the country, apparently, uh, Frank, you lived in a quarter of a million dollar Japanese contemporary home in Chain Bridge Road in McLean, Virginia. Yes. Features a basement firing range on a small scale. And a bookcase that opens into a network of concealed passageways. Doesn't everybody have one? And it's been seized by the Internal Revenue Service in lieu of $2.8 million in unpaid taxes. Yes, that was the government's last effort, right? You know, you go through the list of stuff that you make available, it's absolutely fascinating. Here's this list of stuff that you made available to Amin. There's an item in here, $11,000 for interrogation equipment. $11,850 interrogation equipment. What kind of equipment is that? For basically, interrogation equipment is to assist in the rapid uh, interrogation to get the desired results. You can do it by chemical process. You can do it by, uh, I would say, maybe an interrogation device used in Mexico, which may be a rubber hose is not as sophisticated as using strobe lights, which might be here, or maybe uh, high sound attenuation to drive a person, to make them very uncomfortable. And what kind of chemicals will... will uh... Well, there's sodium pentothal and this things of this nature. You're so matter-of-fact about all of this. I suppose it's... Well, well it exists. Right. Hmm? It exists. I didn't develop it. Your sources for all of this equipment, whether it's torture equipment or explosive equipment or arms or whatever, are mainly U.S. In most cases, I've used U.S. US equipment, yes. Completely dead. Let's see who's on the phone. This may be the I mean at this moment. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hello? Hello? Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Hello? Amin now lives in exile in Saudi Arabia, but he is still trying to get back to power in Uganda and Turple keeps in regular touch. We had asked Turple to place a call to him. Hey, how you been doing? Turple was told that Amin, a Muslim, was out at the moment. I know, he's probably at the mosque. <laughs> Why are you at the mosque? <laughs> okay, listen, I'll call you again, but get in touch with me soon. Okay, talk to you later. Bye. Who's that? The aide de camp. To Amin. To Amin. The world has heard tales of Idi Amin's ruthless liquidation of thousands of Ugandans, from the most humble to the most exalted. Turple reconfirmed for us what manner of man Amin was. You're sitting at dinner with maybe, what, 10 or 15 people, fairly high up in Amin's government, in his dining room in Kampala. In the state house dining room, yeah. Okay, what happened? He thought that it, he had a uh, security problem there. So? He served the security problem on a plate. 
He served up the head of the defense minister on a silver I, platter. I don't... I, I think it was defense minister. I'm not too sure. And the defense minister's head had been served up on this silver platter. Before. Well, it wasn't cooked or anything like that. I mean, it was just... It was just, just severed. <laughs> it was Sever, served raw. It, uh, it was... It, because... Of, because why? Why was the guy's head on the platter? Because I think he was trying to plot a coup against the men in, with other people. And then what happened? And then the other person who uh, was in a, this alleged conspiracy panic. At that point, says Turple, Amin pulled out his own revolver, a 357 Magnum, a gift from Turple, incidentally, and shot that other person in the head. <laughs> <laughs> he shot the perpetrator. And then went on with dinner? Yeah. I mean, of course. And everybody else went on with dinner, too. It was a lesson, I think, to be learned from any other minister that might have thought he was getting too active. You were making jokes about uh, the defense minister's head on the tray. You were making jokes about Amin, uh, Big Daddy. Do you laugh about those things to, to kill the pain? No, <laughs> not at all. I'm not trying to come on. Saying, sure, yeah. I'm not trying to come on pious with you, but I, I, I just wonder about the morality of, of of the way you make a living. Well, the morality at the time with the men's people, the Israelis sold them the Uzis. I didn't sell them the Uzis, so the Israelis made the profit. Are we going to ask Begin what he thinks of it now, or at that time Diane, who was a good friend of the men? And they sold them explosives because. We trained with Israeli explosives. And the PLO helped train uh, Amin's troops. Yes, that's true. Moral of the story? It's a funny world, isn't it? As we said earlier, Turple and Korkula fled the United States to Beirut, where they are now setting up their new restaurant, because they had been caught red-handed by a couple of New York undercover cops posing as South American revolutionaries. They were caught on tape conspiring to sell arms, ammunition, and poison to the two supposed terrorists. The fact of the matter is that you were going to furnish, what was it, 10,000 brain machine guns and a million rounds of ammunition and some poisons, were you not? The machine guns were, yes, we were going to furnish the machine guns and the ammunition, which was perf perfectly legal. We were not breaking any law on that. Uh, well, we considered any law at all at that point. Anyway, then what's the law against poisons, if, if it has anything to do with poisons? Did There's you try out a poison in a Beirut restaurant? Yeah, absolutely not. That's all baloney. Gary, look, this is you talking to Sachs and Rodriguez, the undercover fellas. This is you talking, a spoonful. And when he took a drink of soup, all of a sudden, this one guy down there, one spoonful and his head fell in the bowl of soup. He was gone like that, snap of fingers. Now, this is you talking. Right. I, I said that, but it never happened. And the quotation about the effects of poison is very true. Various uh, poisons, uh, chemicals will do certain things to you, and they are used by governments. And as far as you're concerned, you will, somebody's going to sell them, so you will sell them. In that particular case, I did, yes. I sold them. To South American, you say revolutionaries, I say terrorists. Oh, actually, I didn't sell them a bunch of poisons. They were given a very, very small sample of a poison. They didn't have enough money to buy the whole kit. In sentencing the two of you, the judge, Thomas Galligan, last June said, let me quote, these defendants, this was the two of you, trade in death and destruction. That is their business. They have no allegiance to any flag. They prosper in a world at war. Wherever terrorism and torture are, there they are. And he also recommended that if you be caught, you not be released from prison one minute earlier than the 53 years to which he sentenced you. Now that's pretty tough talk. Yes, it basically sounds like a job description of a special forces type, doesn't it? It does, of a sort. You, th that's right. It depends on the allegiance. If they're against you, they're bad. If they're with you, they're good. Uh, one of the summations of my, uh, I believe it was Gary's attorney, which was bought out, and this was during the uh, problems in Central America, is today's terrorists are tomorrow's allies. It depends on who has the government. You don't care how this stuff is used, Gary? Would I actually sold? No, I don't care how any of that was sold. How do you feel about the fact that your friend Ken Howard, with a British bomb disposal unit, was killed a couple of days ago trying to dismantle an IRA bomb in Central? Very, very badly about that. Yeah, that's... 
course you feel bad about that, but that's the kind of stuff you, that you sell. I never have sold explosives to anyone. Well, your friend over here has. Talk to him, but I haven't. How do you feel about that? About selling explosives? Yeah. How does Dal feel about selling it? How does DuPont feel selling about it? I, yes, I have sold explosives. Sure. And I've sold them to legal governments. I have not sold them to groups. I've sold them to recognized governments. What, what was the recognized South American government that you were selling these? They didn't have explosives. Oh, I oh see. wait a minute. At I that see. time, it was prematurely unrecognized. Frank, Frank, come on, will you? Be sensible. Yeah? You, you're talking about, about selling 10,000 Sten machine guns. You're talking about selling a million rounds of ammunition. You're talking about selling poisons. I mean, you're, you're drawing very fine distinctions here. Your friend Gary got blown up. Ken Howard got blown up. He's with a bomb disposal unit. The same thing can happen to other people who work on the same racket that you guys do. That's just, I suppose, one of the hazards of your trade. It's true. You don't think it's an immoral business, Gary? Maybe I did at one time, but as things developed, uh, I didn't know. After I saw what our own government was doing and what they contacted me to do in their behalf after I was arrested, what, what, wait, what, I what? certainly felt that it was the proper thing to what do. What did our own government do and what did they contact you to do after you were arrested? Well, it, it began even before. Corkola says he had already been working with the U.S. Special Forces and the U.S. Navy, developing sophisticated and deadly weapons and ammunition for them. And in spite of his arrest, he says, they continued to contact him about those items. Incidentally, they were some of the very same terrorist weapons he had sold to those undercover New York cops. One such item, some bullets filled with deadly poison that he was developing for U.S. Navy weapons specialists. Pentagon officials would neither deny nor confirm Corkola's assertions. They say they don't comment on new weapons development. But it was largely because of his continuing government work, especially on weapons and ammunition designed principally for assassination missions, that Corkola and Turpel thought their case would never come to trial, that the government would be afraid of what they might say in open court about the work Corkola had been engaged in. But the trial was scheduled nonetheless, and the day before it was to begin, in September of 1980, they fled the country. Why? Because, says Corkola, one of his attorneys told him he had received a message from an FBI agent that Turpel and Corkola would not be alive long if they were to testify, but that nobody would stop them if they wanted to leave the country. His exact words were something to the effect, they won't uh, help you leave, but they won't do anything to stop it. And I took that at face value. In other words, get out of town. That's exactly it. Corkola's attorney denies he told his client that, Still, Corkola and Turple stick to their story. What is it they want from you? What information do you have that they want? Probably, and this is speculation again, probably that I had been uh, privy to information on the mechanics of Washington, how things are done in Washington, D.C. Deals. Give, give me an example of a deal. Maybe uh, payoffs, let's put it this way. If I wanted something specific, not lobbying, if I wanted something specifically done, maybe I have to reach the right person, and that right person has to be taken care of. According to Turple, some of the people that he and his other associate, former CIA agent Ed Wilson, took care of were American officers from the military assistance group in Iran in the days of the Shah. Those officers, says Turple, for a consideration, would provide him and Wilson valuable inside information on upcoming Iranian orders for American military equipment. That inside information would earn Turple or Wilson a fat commission from the company that got the business. But if they let you know, mm -hmm. and you got 10% off the top, you're going to give that military assistance group officer something in return for his being so kind to make you that living, that gorgeous house down in Virginia, and... We would probably buy him a new uniform, yes. U.S. investigators are also looking into allegations of similar payoffs made by Turple and or Wilson, to a former official of the Department of Energy and the Army Materiel Command, and Turple acknowledges he had further dealings with still another government official in the State Department. Apparently you were well connected with someone fairly high up in the passport office. On a friendly basis, yes. Did you have the fix in with any of the high officials in the passport office in Washington? 
a kind of fixing. If you meant that I could get favors, yes, I could get favors. In fact, we have learned that federal authorities have been investigating one State Department official to whom Turple loaned some $40,000 for construction of a new home. Turple also told us he has certain knowledge of payoffs to at least one active duty CIA official. In return, that man provided classified CIA reports on specific countries. That information to be passed on, for a price, to interested officials of other countries. Do you know active duty CIA men who are currently producing commercial reports, moonlighting for a fee using classified material? Yes. Situation reports, current situation reports, yeah. And they simply sell information to some commercial firm on material that comes... Right, who in turn sells it as a, uh, a service, let's say a... Uh, yes. Basically, sells it as service. And the CIA guy gets some money for it, and the he gets part of the money. Sure. Mm -hmm. You want no. to name any names? No. Of course, the main thing U.S. investigators want to talk to Triple about is his relationship with Libyan strongman Muammar Gaddafi, his dealings, and those of his friend Ed Wilson, who is currently living in Libya. As we said, both Wilson and Triple are under indictment for those dealings, and he was not anxious to talk about that. We hear that he and you shipped explosives illegally. We hear that he and you established a terrorist training school there. We hear that he and you arranged for the assassination of a dissident Libyan living in Egypt. Isn't that accurate? That's hearsay. I, it's under, it's still well, under litigation. It's hearsay. It's right here on a... Uh, you want to read this? U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia. Edwin Wilson, you get second billing. It's all there. Yes, but as I said, I can make any statement about anybody and put it on paper right now. It's, it's up to the government to prove the allegations. But you're not, you're not going to go back and stand trial for those allegations. Well, I'm not saying I won't go back and stand trial for the allegations. Did the CIA know of your dealings with Muammar Gaddafi? Did they know of my yep. dealings? I believe they've got... Uh, Did they know? I would say they know. How many former agents like yourself have gone into the business that you're in? There's quite a few. Uh, when I say quite a few, in numbers, there are probably, uh, in this area alone, there are about 12 to 15 that just go around the circuit. They go into the arms business, too? In some cases. Sell their knowledge to the highest bidder? Not all the knowledge is sold to the highest bidder. There are some lines that have drawn. For instance, I have never, ever worked with any of the bloc countries. Why? It's my own personal reasons. I just don't want to. Turple is talking here about his disdain for dealing with communist bloc countries. Frank Turple and Gary Korkula may be exiled in Beirut, but life is not all that spartan for them. During his spare time, Korkula windsurfs on the beachfront of a Beirut hotel, and he drives around town in what may be the only MG convertible left in Beirut. He and Turple also continue to make business trips to other Middle Eastern countries, including, we have learned, including Libya. And all the while, says Korkula, Various agencies of the U.S. government continue to contact him, trying to persuade him to turn state's evidence against his pal Turple, suggesting, he says, that if he will tell them what he knows about Turple, they might be able to help him somehow with that New York case in which he was found guilty and hit with a sentence of up to 53 years. But every federal or New York official with whom we have spoken says that no deal has been offered or is possible. And they're going to your buddy over here, Gary, to try to get him to turn you in. Right. Right. And you're not going to turn him in. Absolutely not. So you're going to grow together, as I said, like the Sunshine Boys here in Beirut. Your wife, Donna, back in New Jersey. Right. Three children. Haven't seen them since. Two children. Two children. Haven't seen them since. Well, I've seen Donna. I haven't seen my children in over a year. Yeah. And as far as you're concerned? Well... <laughs> As I told you, it was an element of trust uh, with Gary. If 
uh, what can I do? Either you trust somebody or you don't trust somebody. Yeah. Can you see the circumstance under which you might go back and face it? Sure. Drop New York and go back and face the federal charges. Drop New York? Not even drop New York. Give, give me a, 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 if you will, if they really found me guilty of this, because I was guilty of conspiracy in most cases. Give me what would be, uh, if they felt I was still guilty, give me the sentence that's ap applicable to most people on a first offender in New York on this conspiracy thing, which, may, which I honestly believe, and I'm not in the position to say, would probably be one year, two years. I have no idea what the... In other words, go be. back, face the trial, even plead guilty, take your right. two years and go on about your business. And face the federal thing. I don't care about that. But this New York thing was just totally out of proportion, as anybody who... In effect, you're saying they caught you dead to rights in New York, you'll serve what you think is reasonable time, and yeah, then, in other words, what I'm, yeah, exactly what I'm saying, not even making a deal or anything like that. What you're really saying is you want to go home, both of you. Under the right set of circumstances or conditions. And you? Yes, I'd like to go home, sure. Absolutely. Now? No, I'd go on a plane tomorrow, but again, the circumstances have to be a lot better than they are today. But as we said, New York authorities insist that no deal is possible for Corkola and Turple. We asked Admiral Stansfield Turner, director of the CIA under President Carter, what the agency should do about rogue agents like Frank Turple. Said Turner, first of all, contrary to what Turple says, I doubt there are 15 former agents like him doing his kind of business now. But the best way to handle the Turples is to weed them out of the agency when they're 25 or 30. Greed is what motivates them, so find them and get rid of them quick. If you catch them early enough, they won't learn that many secrets. The danger to the agency, said Admiral Turner, is from rot within. A greater danger than when these men get out. You kick them out and take your chances. Let the FBI take care of them. But how well has the FBI been taking care of them? Or the CIA, for that matter? Not as well as they could, say some critics. For several years ago, various federal agencies were alerted to the fact that Turple and Wilson were operating in Libya and elsewhere that they were recruiting active duty members of the special forces to train terrorists in Libya, and that active duty CIA officers may have been connected to those Wilson Turple operations. But little was done about it until the past few months. And it is this failure to act, among other things, that the House Intelligence Committee will be looking into later this month. Introducing the car Cadillac owners preferred overall to a Cadillac. Introducing the 1982 Lincoln Town Car. When Cadillac owners compared DeVille to the Lincoln Town Car based on comfort, roominess, luxury, and ride, 86 out of 100 preferred the Lincoln Town Car. Lincoln Town Car. The car Cadillac owners preferred. There's a piece of the sun in Polaroid's new sun camera so you don't drag people out in the sun to take pictures. I don't have to stand there and squint. No, it's a new system. Why waste a shot in this light? We turned bad light into good pictures. Didn't waste that shot. You've never been so sure of an instant picture. Perfect. But isn't it expensive? No, but wasting film in bad light is. Besides, you never buy flash or extra batteries. How'd they get that sun in there? They did it at night. You've never been so sure. I have a throbbing headache. I got it this morning, taking my son to school. Right on top of my hip, right here. Look here, two regular strand tablets of this pain reliever, 650 milligrams. These others, 650, 650, or 800 milligrams in a special formula, anison. Would you take anison, Mrs. May? Yes, I would. I took the two anison and I feel better. You think you might use next time you have a headache? My anison. Get the anison difference, tablets or capsules. Where are my memos? Where are my memos? Mr. Wolf. Where? Where are we? We used to call him Where's the werewolf. Where's my budget report? Where are those letters? Where's the flowcharts? Mm -hmm. Then we got Lanier's new typemaster to master the work of up to three ordinary typewriters. Must be a monster. Where am I going to put it? Typemaster gives you no problem typing in the space of a regular typewriter. Now Mr. Wolf's like a pussycat. Where have you been all my life? Almost. The new typemaster from Lanier Where? will make your good people even better. 60 Minutes, a CBS News weekly magazine, will continue. Tuesday, Dudley Moore is in for a big surprise. Because he...
he's just seen the girl of his dreams. Bo Derek is the object of his desire. Dad! And he'd climb the highest mountain or cross the hottest desert if only he could hear. Tonight, I spend... Ten, Tuesday at a special time. This is CBS. Diamonds. You want to buy them only from a name you can trust. And the name you can trust is Ardell's. Now is the perfect time to discover that you don't have to spend a fortune for fine quality diamonds. And now during our Fall Diamond Festival, you'll find surprisingly low special sale prices just in time for pre-Christmas savings. Use our convenient Ardell's Layaway and save during our Fall Diamond Festival. Ardell's Catalog Showroom for savings and selection. We brought the book. Every morning for the last 10 years, Cheyenne Mountain Ranch homeowners have congratulated themselves. You would too if you lived in one of the uncommon neighborhoods at Cheyenne Mountain Ranch. Affordable neighborhoods that just keep getting better. Neighborhoods that are here today, here tomorrow. We're close in, but quiet, and surrounded by neighbors who really care. But the nicest thing about living at Cheyenne Mountain Ranch is coming home to the mountain. You can too. Come to the mountain. Channel 11, CBS for Southern Colorado. I have found my new car. The Chrysler Le Baron series for 1982. They are like no other cars in America, Europe, or Japan. No other car combines Le Baron's high mileage, luxury, and seat six. Le Baron has better mileage than every gasoline-powered Mercedes-Benz, Audi 5000, or Toyota Cressida. Lee Iacocca's dream to combine high mileage and luxury is a reality at a surprising price. The 1982 Chrysler Le Baron series. My new car. Hey, Karen, taste my wheat check cereal. Lynn, just because we share an apartment doesn't mean we have to share breakfast. But it tastes so good. Oh, come on, I never like what you like. You'll like the whole wheat taste. You bought this. You have no taste. I was thinking about buying another one. Okay, okay, I'll try it. Delicious. It's like whole wheat. Nice to have a roommate with the same taste, huh? People who don't like check cereals have never tried check cereals. Back in the 1950s, at the height of the Cold War, the object of the arms race was to build and put in place in this country an intercontinental ballistic missile, something that could deal the Soviet Union a devastating nuclear blow. And this was it, Titan. Fifty-two of them built by the Martin Marietta Company were placed in silos in Arizona, Arkansas, and Kansas. They use a very volatile liquid fuel, the best way we had then for reaching the other side of the world with a heavy payload. Titan was designed to serve for 10 years. It's been serving for nearly 20. In those 20 years, we've made giant strides. Minutemen, for example, which use a safe solid fuel and have smaller but more accurate warheads. Today, there are a thousand Minutemen in place. And for 15 years, there's been talk of dismantling our overage Titans. Their once protective underground silos can now be easily destroyed by new sophisticated Russian missiles. With each passing year, Titan becomes more dependent on spare parts. Spare parts that the Air Force says are becoming increasingly scarce. Titan today may be as much of a menace to us as it is to the Russians. When Titan is fired in anger, when all systems are working, it carries with it the biggest nuclear warhead in our arsenal, a destructive force 750 times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. It will flatten everything in a circle nine miles across. But the 52 Titans in place can hit only 52 targets. Each missile has only one warhead. The rest of our missiles, land and submarine-based, single and multiple warheads, all of them with relatively safe solid fuel, they can hit over 6,000 specific enemy targets. So the question must be asked, is Titan, a missile designed in the 50s, the time of the Edsel, is it really necessary? It is the age of Titan and the vicious nature of its propellant that makes the weapon so hazardous to us. The best evidence of that is in the Air Force's own safety studies. They show that in 1978, for example, it was nine times more dangerous to work on a Titan site than in any other job in the Air Force or the Strategic Air Command. And in the seven years between 1973 and 1980, the accident rate due to human error or system failure had increased 10 times. 
It is dangerous. It is dangerous. It's dangerous to the people that work on it. It's dangerous to the people that are in the surrounding areas around the missile for the simple reason that once the tank's punctured, that's it. There's nothing we can do to prevent it, to stop it. Sergeant Jeff Kennedy was an Air Force quality control inspector maintaining Titan missiles at Little Rock Air Force Base. A year ago, he was the central figure, the hero in a Titan accident. This is the first time he's spoken out publicly. He and other men who work on Titans know the risks involved in dealing with a 20-year-old liquid fuel missile system. There's so many places for a Titan missile to leak. It's just unbelievable. It's not uncommon to have three or four board, uh, three or four Titan missiles leaking at once. What makes any leak in a Titan significant is the nature of the propellant. It's not like a mere gas leak. When handling the fuel, a protective suit must be worn that has an internal oxygen supply. In theory, the suit prevents exposure to deadly gases. The chemicals are highly toxic, corrosive, and combustible. They'll burn skin on contact. If inhaled, they can cause death. Air Force documents say, quote, the danger is in the delayed effects of a seemingly mild exposure. Symptoms may not be apparent until several hours or days later. Besides all that, if the two propellants come in contact with each other, they explode. When you offload fuel, does it get into the atmosphere? Oh, yes, definitely. There's just no way we can uh, purge the lines clean. It's just impossible. So when we break the lines loose to, to disconnect the, the, the uh, giant holding trailer that holds the liquid when it's off the missile, uh, we have a tremendous amount of vapors released in the atmosphere. And you're all suited up when you Oh, yes, that. we're all suited up. But the civilians... The civilians are not. A mile away, perhaps? Oh, there's, there's several complexes that have uh, houses right on the complex road. Is there any way to tell how much fuel you're dealing with in a particular missile? Is there a, a gas gauge, in effect, on it? No. No, all we have to do is take x-rays with an x-ray machine. That's the only way we tell. And the x-ray machines are broken down all the time. Exactly how much fuel is on board is of vital importance. Each missile is loaded differently, depending on how far it must travel to reach its particular target. A perfect example is we, uh, one time we, we loaded a bird and the x-ray machine went out and they said it was 682 gallons over. Over. We came out the next day and spent two days offloading it. 682 gallons we offloaded. The x-ray technicians came out the next day, x-rayed it, we were 682 gallons under. So we went out the next day and added 700 gallons and we were on right on the mark. They had x-rayed wrong. You had, you had one missile with that was... 2,200 gallons short. 2,200 gallons short. short right. Which means it would be 2,200 gallons short of its destination. There have been three major accidents over the years with Titan and its propellants that involved civilians. One day out in Damascus, Arkansas, a tanker truck was sitting unattended on a site just like this one here outside of Tucson. The tanker developed a leak, apparently unbeknownst to the Air Force. Nearby farmers saw the toxic cloud over their fields. Some had breathed the fumes. They reported it to the Air Force, who had no idea it was happening. Air Force personnel were 40 feet underground in the command module. Those civilians out in Arkansas hired this man, lawyer William Carter, former White House Secret Service man, to sue the Air Force for damages. The Air Force, he says, resisted. It was their attitude that, that it was uh, not dangerous, that it was not a significant accident and not a significant leak. And though two civilians were seriously injured, uh, they discounted that the chemicals had caused the injuries. The then Surgeon General of the Air Force wrote to Carter saying those civilians had encountered a substance no more dangerous than smog. But later, an article appeared in the Journal of the American Medical Association that said exposure to those same substances, nitrogen dioxide and nitrogen tetroxide, is potentially lethal. And this article was written by... Air Force doctors. Air Force doctors. Yes. Yeah. The civilian teachers at the University of Arkansas Medical School said those chemicals are lethal. There's nothing any more dangerous than nitrogen tetroxide. 
So we knew, and the civilian uh, medical profession knew the danger of them, but the Air Force continued to discount uh, uh, their danger. A few months later, another leak of nitrogen tetroxide, this time in Rock, Kansas, just outside of Wichita. During a propellant transfer, a recycling operation just like this one here outside of Tucson. A nozzle popped loose from the missile down below. The surrounding civilian population was evacuated. And as far as the Air Force was concerned, the situation was well in hand. They're wearing Revco suits rocket fuel handler clothing outfits and they are completely protected against anything they have their own oxygen system inside and they're very well protected the Air Force spokesperson was prematurely optimistic two airmen died the medical reports told why despite protective suit became unresponsive within 30 minutes of entering silo autopsy showed acute pulmonary congestion and chemical burns over entire body. But it was the night of September 18, 1980, back in Damascus, Arkansas, the site of the earlier leaks, that the public, and perhaps the Air Force itself, faced the full horror of what Titan can do when even the simplest of mistakes is made. During a routine check, an airman dropped a nine-pound socket from a wrench. It fell 66 feet down a silo, bounced off the silo floor, and on the rebound, punched a hole in the extremely thin skin of the missile's fuel cell. Fuel began to leak, and the Air Force said Jeff Kennedy, a 25-year-old sergeant, to take a look. I was asked to go, because of the simple reason that I was quality control evaluator on site, and I was uh, the most knowledgeable person uh, on complex at that time. General Levitt, who was the vice commander in charge of SAC, said in testimony after the accident, we simply could not expect the problem to neutralize itself. It would not get better. It would get worse. Whether a Titan warhead would survive intact a catastrophic explosion was a matter of grave concern. Was that concern passed on to you? Did you? No, we were, sure. never, we were never informed of a, any type that an explosion was imminent or possible. The silo had a 750 ton door on it and we figured that there was no explosion possible that could blow a door off that weighing that amount the air force seemed to go into a spiral of confusion that night classified tape recordings indicate they feared the worst yet little was done by way of safety precautions yet they had as it turned out from the time that wrench was dropped nine hours to prepare at 9 20 p.m Kennedy entered the abandoned control center alone. Kennedy read the gauges down below. They showed a massive spill was taking place. It was those readings that told SAC headquarters and the Martin Marietta Company, both on a phone hookup to Damascus, just how serious the situation had become. Six hours later, Kennedy and a partner, Airman David Livingston, were ordered down into the complex, now dangerously saturated with highly combustible vapors. The last order sent to them was to turn on exhaust fans. They did. A second later, the place was blown to bits. When, what in fact happened to that 750 ton door? From what I understand, it went approximately 200 feet straight up and about 1,000 feet off complex. Almost like a tight. Yes, exactly. After the blast, what happened? You were thrown. I was thrown about 150 feet straight back to a fence. Did what happened? The Air Force came in and rushed in and pulled you out, presumably. No. No, the Air Force evacuated. There was 38, 38 people uh, down at the end of the complex, and they were gone. That was that was real hard to accept. But they were gone. They'd uh, completely evacuated. Bugged out is the military word. Yes, exactly. As bad as it was that night, there was a lucky break. That nuclear warhead remained intact. The place looked like Titan's nine megaton bomb had hit it, but it was only a nine pound wrench. The response was not orderly. Medevac helicopters got lost in the dark. Six airmen were badly injured. It took three hours to get Kennedy, and Livingston, who was to live only 18 hours more, the 60 miles to a civilian hospital, where they were both treated by Dr. James Adamson. They had inhaled the fumes, the fumes combined with the water in the lung, and it just 
wipes out the membrane between the air and the blood so that the blood just and fluid just transudates into the lungs. So the, in, in fact, the cause of Livingston's death was? Was this fluid that uh, just poured into his lungs and we just couldn't reverse it. A question that remains unanswered and is the strange neurological symptoms that people have had. The people at Rock, Kansas, uh, some of the people in the Damascus area who drove through what they describe as the uh, fog of the gas. Did the Air Force get in touch with you right after the explosion and say, look, doctor, this is the way we treated those men, the victims of the Rock, Kansas accident? No, I didn't get any information from the Air Force about the Rock, Kansas incident until three or four days later. From the time of the explosion, there was just mass confusion. The whatever emergency procedures they had they apparently didn't follow the air force was unwilling to provide us information about previous accidents until after the damascus explosion we find then that there's been leaks at these same missile sites here in arkansas for years and years and back into the 60s serious leaks after the incident at damascus there was little doubt that there was something inherently wrong with the titan system apart from the loss of life the total cost of that dropped socket wrench was $225 million. I'll repeat that. $225 million over a dropped wrench. A major investigation of Titan was launched. It produced volumes of words and recommended almost 200 changes. It found that a number of sites were way too close to built up centers of population and should be removed. This one in Arizona, for example, is practically in a schoolyard. But so far, Titan remains. The investigation also found the protective suits would not protect in the event of a major leak. And what's more, there weren't enough suits to go around. It found that vapor detectors, the devices that detect a leak, only work about half the time. It is a long and chilling list of inadequacies and shortages. It's hard to believe when you read these documents that something that we've been told is so vital to our survival is in fact so decrepit. There's an odd footnote to the events of the night of September 18, 1980 at Damascus. Jeff Kennedy was given a letter of reprimand for going into the command capsule alone, a violation of security because of classified documents lying around. However, for going down again six hours later, he was awarded the Airman's Medal for bravery. I was going down at 9.20 when I received the letter of reprimand. I went down there for God, my country, the flag, my job, everything. I didn't go down there for any other reason. I gave them my all. And what did I get from them? A letter of reprimand. A letter of reprimand for doing everything I thought was right. Does this mean anything to you now, though, Jeff? No. No, it doesn't. You think that letter of reprimand was written not to, not to really to reprimand Jeff Kennedy, but to cover someone's backside? Yes, mm -hmm. but what about the little guy? What about me? You know, that's true. Maybe somebody up the line had had to cover up. But what about me? That is only one question, and with all due respect to Sergeant Kennedy, the least important question to be put to the Air Force. There are dozens more that involve the security of the country in time of war, and the safety of communities and airmen in time of peace. The Air Force absolutely refuses to answer any questions. As for those 200 recommendations, it's still uncertain if they'll be implemented, given that President Reagan has said that the ancient Titans will be replaced in two or three years by the new solid fuel MX missile. One thing the Strategic Air Command did tell us was that it had no plans to dismantle Titan. The missile stays in place, it says. The MX is merely a plan on a drawing board. So Titan, the blunderbuss of strategic weapons, remains quietly and precariously on guard. A few other bits and pieces about Titan. 
There were indications in the past week or so that MX might never be built. But even if it is and Titan is dismantled, there's the problem of disposing of a million and a half gallons of highly toxic chemicals. And one other footnote. The space shuttle, which was originally to be launched last September, was postponed then because just three gallons of the same propellant that is used in Titan was spilled on the shuttle. The propellant ate away the adhesive on 375 of the tiles that form the shuttle's heat shield. To help you buy a new car, Chrysler is holding 81 sticker prices on its Omni and Horizon Misers and Customs, its Aries and Reliant K two- and four-door base models, 82 cars at 81 prices. And now at participating dealers, Chrysler Saving Certificates save you $300 to $1,000 on most other new 81 and 82 cars and trucks, depending on model. For 82 cars at 81 prices, or saving certificates worth $300 to $1,000, come to Chrysler. For big occasions like today, I always bring along my Kodak camera with Sensolite flash. That's the built-in flash that knows when and if I need more light. Out here, it won't flash. But in here, it will, automatically, every time I need more light. See? Give your family a Kodak camera with Sensolite flash. It's the latest word in pocket cameras. They get better every year. Sensolite flash, only from Kodak, America's storyteller. Tonight on Archie Bunker's Place, Proud Barney's got a new girlfriend, but it's Archie that she's after. And on One Day at a Time, Julie's back when she thinks her husband's had an affair. Max and I have had it. Then Alice's mother brings cheer to her daughter's 40th birthday. The bloom is off the lawn. And on the Jeffersons, George wants Florence back. And here she is. Mm. Ain't this nice? And on Trapper John, before an important operation, Gonzo gets a death threat. And his life is on the line. It's all happening tonight. Before we get around to our mail, Andy Rooney's been looking at his, and he doesn't like what he sees. Government agencies are always doing things that make it easier for them and harder for the rest of us. The U.S. Postal Service, for example, in this official book of theirs, has issued a list of the abbreviations we're supposed to use for state names when we address a letter. We had that one page blown up here so you could read it. Alabama. Alabama, you recall, always used to be ALA. The Postal Service is going to save us billions of dollars and assure that letters to Alabama will be delivered in the same year in which they're mailed by shortening the abbreviation to just AL. AL could also be Alaska, of course, but Alaska is now AK. I have no objection to that, except that AK could also stand for Arkansas. They're just gonna grab the K out of the middle of the word somewhere. California has been shortened from C-A-L to just C-A. To me, Cal has a ring to it that C-A doesn't have. They also ruin N-E-B, Neb, for Nebraska, by making it just N-E, Ne. There's nothing consistent about these abbreviations. That's the trouble with them. If Wisconsin is W-I, how come Pennsylvania is P-A? Why didn't they take the second letter of Pennsylvania and make it P-E? And look at the MIs, Michigan, Minnesota, Mississippi, and Missouri. Any one of them could be MI, but what does the Postal Service do? It takes perfectly good MICH, M-I-C-H, away from Michigan and makes that MI. Minnesota is MN, which could also stand for Montana. Missouri stays as MO. I suppose we're lucky they didn't reassign MO to Montana. Mississippi is MS, MIS which could just as easily be Missouri. So I don't understand these changes in the abbreviations the Postal Service has made, and I think I'm gonna stick with the old abbreviations. I'm still going to use Mass for Massachusetts, Wiss for Wisconsin, and Utah for Utah. I'm just never in so much of a hurry that I can't write out all of Utah. Last week, we told the story of three department store employees who were awarded $1.9 million by a jury which found their employer, iMagnet, guilty of age discrimination. And that story brought this from the president of iMagnet. In your ruthless and selective editing of an interview with our chairman, you omitted to say that he was 63 years old when he was hired, 
You also fail to inform your viewers that charges of age discrimination are common and that CBS News itself is the target of such a suit. The fact is that whereby a jury found I. Magnin guilty of such a charge, in the only age discrimination suit against CBS News ever to come to trial, a jury found CBS News not guilty. On that subject, another letter said, what about cleaning your own house before looking for dust elsewhere? Cronkite, Severide, Chancellor, and Brinkley are being moved out for Brokaw, Rather, Sawyer, Jennings, and Mutt. A self-respecting girl can't get a decent daddy fix anymore. About our story on the pastor who wants to cleanse the public library in Abingdon, Virginia, we got a few letters like this one. Right on, Pastor Williams. I don't pay taxes to supply pornography to public libraries. But far and away, most of the mail was in this vein. If the fundamentalists want the law to suit their own religious beliefs, let them join the fundamentalists in Iran. I'm Harry Reasoner. We'll be back next week with another edition of 60 Minutes. I have found my new car. The Chrysler Le Baron series for 1982. Le Baron combines high mileage and luxury. The coupe even has a Mark Cross interior available. And no other car has front wheel drive, luxury, and seat six at so surprising a price. Leah Iacocca's dream to combine high mileage and luxury is a reality. The 1982 Chrysler Le Baron series. They are like no other cars in America, Europe, or Japan. My new car. Bell System Knowledge brings you a way to manage information more productively. Dimension PBS, a programmable electronic communication system for making critical connections more rapidly. Increasing profits. Controlling costs. Saving energy. Creating new information management possibilities for an endless variety of businesses. Dimension PBS, from Bell. have been selling illegal arms to Libya. Why did these agents get involved? Did the CIA know about it? Could it have been a conspiracy? A revealing special report tomorrow on the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather. Now stay tuned for Archie Bunker's Place coming up next. on the season premiere of Nurse. Finchley almost killed a patient. Why are you protecting him? Mary risks her career when she fights a cover-up. Oh, God. Then it's Kevin Dobson in the exciting premiere of Shannon. At home, he's more than just a single parent. At work, he's more than just a cop. Shannon, right after Nurse, Wednesday. This free brochure could chop 25% off your home energy use. Gives you a dozen energy-saving tips. Money savers. Best of all, it shows you that saving energy makes sense. Dollars and cents. Send for it today. Write the Alliance to Save Energy, Washington, D.C. This is CBS. We asked Roger Staubach to find out how people spell relief. How do you spell relief? For acid indigestion, R-O-L-A-I-D-S. For heartburn, R-O-L-A-I-D-S. Rolaids really does spell relief. Like a sponge, Rolaids antacid medicine consumes 100% of the acid required to give millions 100% relief. How do you spell relief? I spell relief R-O-L-A-I-D-S. For millions of Americans, Rolaids spells 100% relief. Hi, I'm Carlo Rossi. And I'm his wife, Maria. The timing of the grape harvest is one of the most important decisions made each year. So the grapes are constantly tested and picked only when they reach the perfect flavor for Carlo Rossi wines. That's why our Vin Rosé has such a pleasant, soft taste. It's perfect any time. I like talking about Carlo Rossi Vin Rosé. <laughs> but I'd rather drink it. <laughs> Be prepared. Do you think you know what scouting's all about? Take a look. Be prepared. Are you ready to get involved? Be prepared. Are you ready to take the lead? Scouting.
scouting today is a lot more than you think. Join your local troop. Channel 11, CBS for Southern Colorado.